Welcome to Have History Will Travel, your quick yet supercharged dose of history. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and today on the program I will address a moment in the Battle of Gettysburg that the 1993 movie Gettysburg should have included. This movie stands as one of the best movies created on the military actions of the American Civil War. Although much of it was adapted from a novel entitled Killer Angels, its historical accuracy shines through and puts the viewer squarely in the middle of the bloodiest battle on the North American continent. The main events that the movie dives into are the first day's battle with Union Cavalry Commander John Buford and the Confederate Corps under Richard Yule and A.P. Hill, focusing mainly on Henry Heath's division. The next event is the second day's battle for Devil's Den and subsequently Little Round Top, showing Joshua Chamberlain as the savior of the Union Army because of his famed bayonet charge. The largest event that the film highlights is the fateful event known as Pickett's Charge, where roughly 10,000 Confederates marched across a mile-long field to attack the Union Center and get annihilated in their attempt. However, there is a moment on the second day of battle that gets no attention from the movie, but I find as one of the most compelling stories of the entire battle. The first day of battle around the little town of Gettysburg resulted in Robert E. Lee's army being bloodied, but they had pushed the federal troops through the town and onto the heights surrounding the town, mainly Culp's Hill and Cemetery Ridge. Commander of the Army of the Potomac, General George Meade, set up his defenses along those elevated terrains. He placed the 2nd and 3rd Corps under General Winfield Scott Hancock and Dan Sickles, respectfully, on Cemetery Ridge. One contributing factor to the overall second day's battle was the decision by Dan Sickles, who deserves his own episode dedicated to him, to move his entire corps forward to higher ground that laid in front of him along the Emmitsburg Road. This exposed his corps to attack. Lieutenant General James Longstreet's corps, commanded by John Bell Hood and Lafayette McClaws, gets the attention of the movie when Longstreet attempts to drive back Sickles and attack the Union left flank, with an emphasis on Hood's movements. McClaws' attacks through the Peach Orchard get overlooked in the film as well as the divisions and brigades from other corps who join in the attack on the Union 3rd and 5th Corps. Major General Richard Anderson's division of A.P. Hill's Corps was to the left of McClaws, and more specifically, Brigadier General Ambrose Wright's Brigade of Georgians was to the immediate left. While Longstreet's troops broke the Union lines around the wheat field and the peach orchard, Wright moved toward Cemetery Ridge. Lang's Floridians were to his right, and Posey's Mississippians to his left. During Wright's attack, Lang fell back from overwhelming numbers, but the Georgians pressed on, with the Mississippians to their left, but Posey's men slowed down as Wright neared the Union lines. Brigadier General Ambrose Wright's men let go a demonic yell as they approached the two federal regiments along Emmitsburg Road. The Massachusetts and New York veterans responded with a deadly volley, sending scores of Wright's men sprawling into the grass. One federal soldier called it one of the most destructive volleys I have ever witnessed. They hesitated, then reeled, they staggered and wavered slightly, yet there was no panic. Undeterred, the Georgians pressed on. After overwhelming the Union defenders immediately to their front, they turned their attention to the Federal artillerymen in their way as they concentrated toward Cemetery Ridge and the copse of trees that made their home there. The cannon fire tore large gaps in Wright's line, but the Georgians' advance continued. As the artillery fire cut down their men, remembered one of the artillerists, they would waver for a second, only to close up and continue their advance, with their battle flags flying in the breeze and the barrels of their muskets reflecting the sun's dazzling rays. A foot soldier who participated in the charge recalled that shells around us tore our bleeding ranks with ghastly gaps. We pressed on, knowing that the front was safer now than to turn our backs and with a mighty yell, we threw ourselves upon the batteries and passed them, still reeking hot. After a long journey to Cemetery Ridge, the Georgians broke the Union line along the stone wall and proceeded to the ridge's summit. Without adequate support from Lang or Posey, Wright was forced to fall back across the field they had fought so hard to cross, the sanctuary of the Seminary Ridge that housed the Confederate defensive line. 
Wright's losses were staggering. All but one of his regimental or battalion commanders were killed, and about half of his 1,400-man brigade had been killed, wounded, or captured. The next day on July 3rd, Lee would order multiple divisions and brigades to try to accomplish what Wright had done with one brigade, roughly 15% of the troops that would be used the next day. The movie Gettysburg got a lot of attention directed toward the American Civil War, but its limited depictions leave out extremely important aspects, people, and events that are needed to tell the amazing story of Gettysburg. Thank you all for listening. If you have any suggestions to what events should be included, please leave them in the comments, and I'll see you next time.